What's it like to play the Nintendo Entertainment System? Entertainment system. Now you're playing with power. Good afternoon and welcome back. If you happen to be a kid in the 1980s, or possibly you had children yourself, you probably remember the Nintendo craze. 30 years ago, Nintendo was the number one selling toy of the 1988 holiday season. That year, Nintendo grossed $1.7 billion in sales. The advancement of technology has forever changed our lives and continues to power the growth of the oil and gas industry. This brings me to our next panel discussion, game-changing oil and gas technology. The moderator for this panel discussion is the manager of strategic initiatives for the Denver Metro Economic Development Corp. Please help me in welcoming Lisa Hoff to the stage. Everybody. Thanks for coming back after lunch. Glad to see some faces out there, although these lights are kind of bright. Um, well, I'm really excited today to help moderate the panel on technology. Developing new technology and better ways to access natural resources has been a part of the oil and gas industry for a long time. But recently, innovations in new technology and smarter uses of data has revolutionized oil and gas production making it much more efficient, safer, and economical, even at lower commodity prices. Complex drilling operations and state-of-the-art completion technologies have transformed entire basins and fields, making them more competitive and helping secure America's energy future. Increased expertise, coupled with a desire to reduce environmental impacts, has really revolutionized this industry. So today, I'm excited to share the stage with an expert panel of leaders to dive into this issue of game-changing technology and explore how it not only helped industry survive the recent market downturns, but how it can help us allow us to thrive well into the future. So let me introduce our speakers and have them come up, and then we'll get into a robust discussion. Just so you know, their full biographies are in your programs, so we'll just Start with some quick introductions. They're coming in from all sides. All sides. <laughs> That's great. Just, just like you drill, right? All over. Coming in from everywhere. Practice this. Uh, well, first up, we have Doug Suttles, who's joined in Canada as the president and CEO in June of 2013. Then we have Mr. Jim Brown. He is president of the Western Hemisphere of Halliburton. I just love that title. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's a great title. And then. Dave Stover, Chairman, President, and CEO of Noble Energy. So welcome, everybody. Uh, let's get started here with you, Doug. Can you tell us a little bit about how Encana approaches in technology and what successes you've had recently? Yeah, and I thought, first of all, thanks for having, having me a part of this group. Uh, I've known these two gentlemen for a very long time, and I'll do my best to keep up with them uh, this afternoon. I, I thought I'd do one quick thing, though, and ask them, how many people here worked in the oil and gas sector in 2010. Hold your hand up. Great, quite a few. I thought I'd just, just to give a sense of technology and innovation, 2010, US oil production was 5.4 million barrels a day. Natural gas was about 70 BCF. The Permian made less than a million barrels a day. The Eagleford made less than 100,000 barrels a day. Uh, Appalachia, the Marcellus, and the Utica were producing seven BCF per day. Um, the U.S. was importing about 60% of its oil requirements in 2010, and the oil rig count was about 650. 
Now, if we fast forward to 2018, um, the DOE this week said U.S. oil production hit 11 million barrels a day, so it's doubled. U.S. gas production is uh, one BCF a day short of, 90, of 100. It's 99 BCF a day, so it's up 40% over that time period. Appalachia is now producing 29 BCF a day. Um, just in, in the last eight years, that, that 22 um, billion BCF a day of growth is one and a half times all the gas production in Canada, just to put a sense of scale on that. The Permian's now 3.4 million barrels a day. The Eagleford's 1.5 million barrels a day. And the rig count is 850 or so. Um, and by the way, what's also kind of cool is CO2 emissions in the United States are at 20-year lows. Um, it's kind of a neat set of facts. And you kind of ask yourself, how did we get there? How the heck did that happen? Um, and of course, a lot of people think of it as the shale revolution. It started in gas and moved into oil, unconventionals. But it's really a story about innovation and technology. Um, and uh, in fact, it, I would actually argue that this is the real tech sector. Uh, what, I mean, what we're doing is not just creating an app, we're actually creating a product that drives the world today. Um, and in fact, an interesting statistic is if you look at the productivity of a rig today in terms of the amount of production it's, it's delivering, it's about two and a half times what it was just four years ago. So about 250% improvement. So the wells are bigger and stronger and they're drilled faster and quicker than ever before. And that's all about technology and innovation. And, and it is this constant drive to find ways to do things better, faster, more efficient, less impact, safer, constantly. And, and the good news about all this is there's still more than 80% of the resource still in the ground to play for. It's just a massive prize. But it, it's actually not a new story about our industry because if you follow um, the discussion from 2010, which was all about peak oil, uh, we were going to run out. By the way, that's a story that's been told in every decade this industry's been in existence since 1860. And we still haven't found it yet because oil demand's now at about 100 million barrels a day. The growth in the last two years of about 1.7 million barrels a day is about as strong as it's ever been. This year looks to be fairly similar. So the world needs our products. And what's driving us today is how do we constantly figure out how to do things better, faster, more efficient, safer, and have a, a smaller impact. Um, and there's more and more ways to do that than there ever has been before, whether that's you know, some very popular topics like big data or whether that's automation or whether that's fundamentally just people constantly saying, how can I find new resources? How can I unlock those resources? How can I do it more efficiently than, the, than it's been done before? Uh, and of course, what that's doing is feel, feeding this great demand for growing energy, which is really driven by the developing world, which is a really neat story because what's happening in the developing world is people are, are moving into what we take for granted and it's powered by energy. Uh, and without affordable energy, they can't do those things. So uh, I kind of always think about this in the end. There was a famous geologist in the industry, some of you may have heard of, Wallace Pratt was his name. He's kind of his heyday was in the 30s. And he made a statement uh, way back then, and he said, uh, oil's not found in the ground, it's, it's found in the, uh, in the minds of men. And of course, today that statement should say, oil and gas is not found in the ground, it's found in the minds of men and women. And that's actually true. Uh, so I, later on, we can probably talk about some of the things we're driving hard on, because all we, all we do is unconventionals. We're one of the biggest companies in the world that does that in terms of we produce almost 400,000 barrels a day, and every one of those barrels comes from a horizontal well with a multi-stage hydraulic frack job in it, and that's about as big as anyone that, that does that. And we're constantly trying to figure out how to do it better. We're probably most known today about what we, what we call the cube, um, which is really about how do you develop in 3D, how do you maximize the resource and do it at the, at the most uh, cost-effective way you can do it in the most efficient way possible. Well, thank you. Maybe you know, that was a good segue talking about some of the levels that you get in there in the production. So maybe, Jim, you could talk to us a little bit about how, how Halliburton approaches technology. Well, sure, Lisa. Thank you. And it's, it's a pleasure to be here today. And I, I want to thank Koga for the opportunity. I have. I've been on several panels with these two guys. So Doug always steals my speech and, <laughs> and Dave takes my questions for me. But I'll, I'll still attempt to... To talk. I want, I want, first, a side comment. Um, next year, Halliburton 
will uh, celebrate its 100th year in business, which is pretty amazing. Uh, Earl P. Halliburton um, founded Halliburton Oil Well Cementing Company in 1919. And um, it's pretty amazing for a Fortune 500 company to, to, to make that statement, to uh, be alive 100 years later. So we're very proud of that. And we're looking forward to celebrating uh, next year with, with our employees, our customers, and, and more importantly, the, the communities that we um, live and work in. So I wanted to make that comment. Certainly Doug hit on it. I mean, when you, when you talk technology, I don't think our industry gets the credit in terms of, of what we've accomplished. And uh, I, I speak primarily around the the North American independent oilman and where we've come through all of the challenges and, and uh, all of the uh, issues that, that face this, um, this industry. I, I think a good, a good way to kind of characterize what has happened, if we were sitting up here 10 years ago and we talked about that we could drill a well in the DJ Basin, 18,000 feet, in five to six days, knock that out, we'd say, well, you're, uh, there's no way. And, and that kind of really epitomizes where we're at. You know, today we're asked uh, with Halliburton, as, a large, as the largest service company in North America, whether it's small or large, we touch about 80 or 90 percent of every wells. And we're often asked, and I'm often asked, you know, where is the next Permian Basin? Where's the next uh, Codel Niobrara, the next... Uh, scoop stack, and um, certainly today we are we are drilling through some some thin source rocks and resident rocks where there's hydrocarbons, and and certainly uh, there are deeper horizons that through technology will be uh, the economics will ultimately uh, come into play and they'll be unlocked. But the way we like to look at it is in, in a different way, and that is. What are the recovery rates today in the different basins? And arguably, you can say the DJ Basin, for example, 8 to 10 percent, we're getting that much hydrocarbon uh, out of the ground in place. Well, what if we could take that from single digits to double digits? That's what we've been focused on. If we could, if we could add 20 percent to our recovery rates, or even 30 percent, so think about that, or 50 percent, uh, that means in our same footprint, that we, we could really add value by increasing those reserves. So we're focused on that. And in reality today, when you look at what industry has done in the last decade in, in the unconventional development, it's been about size, um, logistics, um, speed, and efficiency. And that was required, and, and rightfully so, because that's how we, we brought processes down to an affordable cost that will work with, uh, in, in, in among the ebb and flows of, of the commodity price environment that we deal in. So we started looking at this. We said, how do we improve recovery rates? And really today, and I'll just walk through what happens, you know, Doug talks about the cube and the challenges of, of, of our customers as they develop their play. Right, and that is in, in, a, in a stacked environment, how do they determine really how many wells to place in that DSU? At what depths, what orientation? That's a challenge in itself to, most, you know, to get the most economic uh, process by which they can, they can uh, drain that reservoir. Next, the well, is, the well is drilled. And as we discussed, drilling has is, is come light years in terms of the speed and the efficiency and the safety that we can drill wells. Then we get into the completion. And as everyone knows today in unconventionals, when you look at an AFE of a well, uh, 70 to 80% of the cost now is after that pipe is run in the ground. I'm gonna take you back to the vertical days just briefly. In the vertical days, we had one, two, three horizons. And when we drilled a well, we would take the rock properties off that particular zone. We would engineer a stimulation treatment for that vertical horizon. And that entailed taking all the rock properties and reservoir properties, plugging it into a frack model, and, and that kicked out a design that we'd go out and stimulate a well. And, and that design could vary on the next horizon. So you could take the Niobrara and the, 
and the Codel. You could, you could, you could go over in the Peons Basin, you go in the Mid-Continent, but those were prescribed treatments for what knowledge we had then in those zones. Well, if you think about it today in the horizontal, it's the same thing only in a horizontal application. But are we really prescribing treatments along that lateral? In the efforts to create the efficiency and the logistics, we've really focused as an industry on surface efficiency and those platforms that deliver that to get the cost down, safely get the cost down. But what we've done once the well is drilled, engineers go in, they look at their perforation scheme, they look at their orientation of their perforations, look at their cluster scheme, how many compartments they want, um, what type of propant they're going to use, the fluid they're going to use, and usually they land on a, a pound per square foot in terms of linear foot in terms of what they want to place in propant. They then through trial and error, we've determined whether it's 20 stages, 18 stages, 30 stages, divide by that number and that's your job. Then we go out and efficiently and effectively pump that. But as in the vertical days, are we really prescribing a treatment for that reservoir? We know across a 2000 foot lateral that reservoir varies. So how in a spreadsheet engineering environment, in, a, in a, a, a drag and drop environment, could we prescribe treatments and plug that into a factory mode operation? Well, that's what we're working on at Halliburton. I'll give you a great example. We've worked with our clients. First, we, we work and, and develop a meticulous earth model. We take that earth model and all the reservoir data and the, and, and the rock properties, and we plug it into a fracturing model, which drives the design. And, and, and through diagnostics on post-fracturing treatments, we have shown on a job that one zone will take all of our fluid. We're under-treating some zones, and we're over-treating other zones. So therefore, the capital efficiency along that lateral is not good. So if we could prescribe treatments, design a job, understanding the sweet spots along the lateral, understanding faults, understanding all the rock properties across that, and prescribe a treatment, plug it into the factory mode, then you've solved the, solved the problem. Well, we're actually doing that now and have good historical data in several basins. And what does it mean in the end? We've got good capital efficiency along the lateral, we are now pumping less product, significant lower cost, and making better wells. So those are the type of things we're working on at Halliburton on, on the completion side, again, with our, with our customers. I'll briefly touch on the drilling side, what we're doing. And it really is, Doug touched on it, it's automation. It's taking a bottom hole assembly that incorporates the bit, the motors, the diagnostic tools, to where we drill into a digital asset, it reads that digital asset, and through reliable telemetry, it sends it to the top drive of the rig, to a smart rig, and it, and, and it becomes automated. So whether you're, you're looking at, at your orientation, right to left, up or down, whether that tool is sensing vibration, send, sends a uh, signal to the top drive to adjust, whether you're using diagnostic tools that read resistivity and you need, you need that resistivity disparity to stay in zone, it sends that and the top drive adjusts. That's robotic drilling and, and we're well down that path. And it, it's very exciting and uh, over the next several months, you'll be seeing a lot of that automation on the drilling side. So those are, those are two areas that Halliburton is working on. That's great. I mean, I think, you know, that automation and technology, maybe that, that engineer was working on that Nintendo back in the day and, and got an idea back then. Um, Dave, you know, Noble's been doing great things up in the DJ. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about your technology usage up there. You bet. I uh, will. Uh, first, let me go on record, clear the record, and say I have no idea who these two characters are beside me. Never been around them. But uh, first, shout out to Dan and, and the Koga group for all the work that they do, their staff, all the volunteers from the industry. 
that uh, play such a critical role up here in preserving and promoting this industry. I mean, and you see the importance of it today, and thanks for bringing everybody together and having all the discussion that you've pulled together today and yesterday. I, I think first, before I start here in the DJ Basin, uh, Doug mentioned something about uh, the impacts in undeveloped countries. Peter D. at lunch today mentioned the quality of life and the things that we here in the U.S. take for granted. Being an international company, you get to see the impact of technology ar around the world, and it's, it's pretty powerful uh, from what this industry's done and, and the opportunity that it still has in front of it. I mean, you think of things, you know, outside of the unconventional space, but you think of the advances in deep water access around the world. You think of uh, LNG, liquefied natural gas, and how that's now made gas a more marketable global product and bring that to areas that haven't had energy access. So the accessibility of affordable energy around the world is impactful. The opportunity is that, you know, I saw a statistic here recently that there's still around a billion people in the world that don't have access to electricity, things that we take for granted. There's two and a half billion people that don't have access to clean cooking fuel. I mean, that's an environmental opportunity along with a quality of life opportunity. So it just struck me there. And then as I was thinking about not just here, but the international impact, one of the things we've had the opportunity to do through new technology, through an area that people said was impossible, was to bring gas resources offshore Israel into Israel. And five wells now supply over 60% of the power needs of that country. So being able to see firsthand the impact that the technology has had first in creating an energy source where folks didn't think it was possible, but then the use of that energy source and then the, the tie of that energy source to security. And I, I mention that because if you think about it back here in the US, and you don't hear about it that often, but one of the remarkable aspects of the unconventional shale revolution, if you will, is that we've gone from discussions of importing LNG terminals to we can't have enough export LNG terminals. We're exporting oil now. We can't get enough oil to the Gulf Coast to export additional oil. But it's changed the U.S.'s position on a global stage. And I mention that from a security aspect because I think that becomes personal to each and every one of us. How many of you out there have children or grandchildren? Show of hands. The thing that makes it personal to me is when I think of my three and a half year old grandson, the fact that we now have less dependence or possibly almost going to no dependence on international sources of oil, foreign sources of oil, probably makes the likelihood of him being deployed much less. So to me, that's personal type of thing, and it should be to everybody in here. I think when you, when you come back closer to home to the DJ Basin, you know, one of the things that we found as we came into the basin on the heels of a patina transaction in, in 2005, we found the opportunity to take a vertical gas field into a horizontal oil field. And it's been quite remarkable. I think, uh, you know, over that period of time, What's happened is you've moved, and, and these guys have touched on it a little bit, you've moved lateral lengths on the drilling side. You've put integrated development plans, central processing facilities. The impact of that is that the footprint now out here in the basin on right now, we can produce the same amount of hydrocarbon using two and a half surface acres that previously took 400 surface acres. I mean, that's a big impact and uh, says a lot about just a little bit of the innovation that we can probably expand on as we go through some of this. That's great. Thank you so much. I mean, I think talking about that two acres now instead of 400 acres, is that the right numbers? I mean, a panel earlier today talked about how to be a better neighbor and address the intersection of industry now with um, suburbia coming right at the door or that, that space. So maybe we can get some ideas on how technology, I mean, that's a great example there. But 
how else could technology solve some of the issues that we're seeing uh, with growth in operating areas? Any of one welcome to jump in? Well, I, I, maybe I'll pick up one area that, uh, uh, you know, I think the, the image of the industry and the reality of the industry are, are one always lags the other, I think, in that, um, because if you think about all of us, one thing people forget is we actually live and work where these oil fields are developed, and uh, we want those places to be good places to live and work in as well. In a great example in our industry, we actually use a lot of water. It's actually only a very small piece of the total water being used by society, but we still use a piece. But we're all working quite hard how to recycle water. In other words, take the water we're producing out of these wells and use it to, to, to frack the next well, to stimulate the next well. Uh, and just to give you a sense of, of our own history now, in our operations in West Texas today in the Permian Basin, we're at about 40% of all the water we use now is recycled water, and that's going up every single year. In some of our operations out there, we're at 100% today. In Canada, we're almost at 100% now. You, you may be aware of uh, the wildfires in British Columbia that are happening right now. So they're not just in Southern California, they're in British Columbia quite heavy right now. And they've just put a restriction on use of surface water for anything but municipal use. That's actually having no impact on our operations in British Columbia. We're the biggest operator in British Columbia because we actually recycle 100% of the water there and use non-potable sources. So that's just another example of, of how we're trying to make sure that we're doing everything we can to minimize the, these potential interfaces in, the, in what could even be conflicts uh, a, a that are out there. Footprint is another big one we all work on. And by the way, the nice thing about all these, they also reduce our impact, but they also make our business more efficient. Mm -hmm. and, and, this, and this is where innovation occurs. Uh, one of the things I'm, I'm most proud of, if you go out to where we are, what we call our water resource hubs in, uh, in the Midland Basin, the coolest thing about them is how simple they are. If you ever want to know what a million and a half barrels looks like, go out to one of our water resource hubs. It's a million and a half barrels of water uh, that has some source water and recycle water that come into a single big pit, and we can simultaneously uh, source five sp fact spreads. The whole thing takes about 90 days to build, and, a million, and between one and a half and three million dollars. Um, so it's not only deeply efficient, um, it's very effective, and it's a way to do this recycling while making the business better. And by the way, when we don't need it someday, it's a, it's a line surface pit. We can take the liner up and reclaim the land, and you'd never know it was there. Anything else? Yeah, I'd say just to add on, I mentioned the integrated development plans. What, the, what that really is, and we started this up here in the DJ base, and it's laying out what I call a master plan community for moving all your product, whether it's oil, gas, water, pipeline infrastructure. You lay that out, you plan that, you tie it into central facilities. And, you know, what it does is not only it reduces that footprint, but what we've moved to now is we've moved this to scalable central facilities, more modular type facilities. So you only are using what you need and you move it off or move it on type of thing. So you're only using what you need at that point in time. The, the other benefit of this is as you're moving things through pipelines, you're taking trucks off the road. For example, in 2017, I think we calculated versus the old way of operations, we probably took just us alone half a million trucks off the road, or half a million truck miles off the road. So, you know, it's impactful. I think the other thing, and, and Jim touched on it, is reducing cycle time. You talked about it on the drilling side, opportunity on the completion side. So the shorter time you're on location, the shorter time that it's an issue for anybody else. That's great. Jim. Yeah, I think these guys touched on about everything. I mean, the master plan community in the oil field and, and how, how uh, urban America as it, as it meets industry. And certainly, Lisa, Colorado is, is a template for what's happening across the nation, whether it's in Pennsylvania, whether it's in Oklahoma, Texas, you name it. We, we kind of set the stage several years ago. And there, there's too many, there's really too many items to mention. But, uh, you know, a few of the, getting down into the details, what we're doing today, um, you know, we design and build our own equipment. And, and when we build that tool, whether it's an energized piece of equipment or whether it's a tool, first it's designed for safety, number one. 
But, but secondly, it's, it's designed for the footprint that it's going to take. Third, it's designed for the emissions that it's going to emit. And, and, and fourth, it's um, designed for the, uh, for the uh, noise that it, that it uh, actually emits in the community. And you've all heard of, of many of the, the mitigating um, processes and pieces of equipment that we're deploying today that, that takes noise away. Um, emissions, tier four engines. Ultimately, when you think about it, when, when you look at the, the process of hydraulic fracturing, for example, I, I don't believe there's no reason five years from now that we could be running electronic fleets as our primary way to, to hydraulically stimulate an oil and gas well. Running line gas, running electronic fleets, very, very low emissions, very low noise, uh, longer life of that horsepower unit. And, and, and that's a great example of, of where industry is going as, again, we, we, com we, we develop near and around urban areas. One other great example, and, and uh, I think Doug touched on it, the road traffic, uh, and Dave did too. When, when you look at the road traffic, we are right now um, looking at the cost benefit and we're piloting a program right out here in Colorado. Everyone knows offshore we've uh, transported our, our crews to and from um, offshore platforms by helicopter. We are actually um, starting a pilot program here in the DJ Basin, transporting our fracturing crews to location by helicopter. Obviously, on any process, there's a cost benefit to it, and it's, it's, to, it's to really realize the benefit and mitigate those costs. But it's looking real at this point. So what does it do? It takes several vehicles off the road. As you know, with, with Colorado growing at the pace of 5,000 to 8,000 a month over the last year, traffic and traffic ac accidents are becoming more prevalent. So we're taking people off the road, trucks off the road, which emit, emit dust. And more importantly, when you look at our employee, there's less time to and fro, more time doing what we hired them to do, and more time with their family. So, back to the quality of life, it really adds to that. So those are some examples and details of what we're trying to do as, as again, industry meets urban America. Well, that's great, Jim. And I think, you know, highlighting Colorado, if we can kind of stay on that theme, you know, Colorado has been a leader in a lot of areas. We've seen a lot of great growth in, in smaller companies stepping in and innovating and de developing new technologies. I think Dave and Doug, I mean, both your companies were very involved here on the state's methane rules. And maybe if you could talk a little bit about technology around that issue and how it's really helped um, reduce emissions along the front range. And as you said, productivity has been up. Go ahead, Dave. Well, okay. Yeah, I mean, you know, it wasn't popular for some of us at the time. <laughs> Doug, if you and I remember. But, uh, you know, it felt like the right thing to do. I mean, you wanted to be part of the solution instead of somebody just coming and tell you what to do because things were heading that way anyways. But we had been, and I'm sure some of the others had too, but we had been testing for some time, even before this period, some of this infrared camera technology and so forth to be able to identify when the emissions were occurring and be able to address those quickly. So the real impact of that was now a a schedule, if you will, and a system for looking for emissions and addressing them very quickly. I think when you look at uh, just the impact here along the front range, since the whole horizontal play concept took off, we've seen a statistic, at least I've seen about a 400% production increase and a 45% emissions decrease. That's unbelievable, yep. really. Yeah, and I, you know, a couple of things I'd add. I, I think that what that was an example of, and, and I think it's a great pattern, and, and I sense there's more of this coming now. When industry and regulators work together to find ways to unlock innovation and creativity to how to solve the problem, it's so much better than when it's mandated. 
Uh, so when we talk about here's where we'd like to go, then how do we how do we turn loose? Whether it's small and medium sized enterprise, whether it's companies of the scale and horsepower of a Halliburton, to figure out the best way to solve the problem. Because if we if we don't do it efficiently, ultimately those costs flow to the consumer. They ultimately flow downhill. And this was a great example of figuring out what is the goal we're trying to reach. And how do we create a regulatory framework which allows industry, and not just oil and gas companies or the service companies, anybody to help us figure out how to do this. I can tell you today, some of this technology we're doing now, because we do this all across our operations, it's not unique to Colorado. We've just piloted a program in, uh, in Canada where we've mounted infrared cameras on our pickup trucks so that everywhere the operator drives, we're getting that signature. Where the old model was you had to have a dedicated individual go search for it, now we realize we can use analytics in the background to interpret what that camera's seeing. So instead of having the operator go search for it, the truck's finding it as we go. And another example of this, we just um, uh, last year brought on the three uh, largest gas plants built in Western Canada in the last 20 years. And they run on hydroelectricity. Uh, they actually, when you go them, they make no noise and you can't smell them. You can't see them. We took out the, the new energy minister of uh, British Columbia to go, to go see the, these facilities. And she didn't believe she was at an oil and gas operation. Uh, she said, where's the oil? Where's the smell? Where's the sound? And these were the biggest plants. Now, you can't do that everywhere. We have access to hydro there, and that was a great case. We do, but when we do that, if we combine an electrified gas plant with a partially electrified LNG facility, we'd actually deliver LNG to Asia with about 60% less carbon emissions than others. And, and I push all this because no one forced us to do this. Right. It made good this is what, it, it, but it's also, it, we're trying to reduce the impact ourselves. We're not, the, this industry, we live and work in these communities. We have, as, as uh, um, Jim and Dave referenced, we have children and grandchildren who we want this to be a great place to live in, and we need good jobs, and we need a healthy economy, and we need to provide energy to nations which don't have all the things we have, and we also need to try to balance it with some of those other forces. So we're trying to do these things. The difference is we have to figure out how to do them efficiently, and I would just tell you, when you turn the creativity of this industry and all the people who want to feed into this industry loose, it's pretty amazing what you can achieve, actually. Well, that's great. Before we run out of time, I want to say there's cards on your tables. If anyone had uh, some questions, we'd prefer you write them down and just, um, I think there's people from Koga walking around, so we'll get a couple of those up here. Um, we have a couple more for you, Jim. questions for the panel, and then we could jump down into that. Um, so we've heard a lot about kind of a great shift, change, creativity, innovation. Uh, we've got some great universities in this state. How do you think technology might attract a new generation of engineers, data scientists, software developers, even drone operators to this industry? Have you seen a change in, in your employee bases? Well, I'll jump in there. Um, I think it's right in the wheelhouse of today's generation when, when you start looking at neural networks, automation, robots, um, software, uh, writing software, um, writing software that, that, that speaks to each other. If you look at today's generation, I think that uh, that's right in their wheelhouse and we're finding, you know, we hire hundreds of engineers a year and they're not only from um, the hard sciences, I'm, I should say they're not only engineers, but they're from the hard sciences, but, but a lot uh, of co computer science and software people. And it's for that reason. Um, we're not unlike any other industry. Automation, robotics, um, neural networks are a big part of our business and um, we're getting a lot of attention from the universities around those activities. I think that one of the biggest challenges we have um, is overcoming this mindset that we're not high tech. We are and we always have been. I mean, my company, almost everyone in my company has a science or engineering degree or a finance degree. Our, our field staff are highly trained now. Actually, we run our operations off iPads today. We have a, two remote operating centers, one here in Denver and one in Grand Prairie, Alberta, which can actually monitor and control every well in the company 24 hours a day. And those skill sets are there. So, But once we get people inside this industry and they see what the technology we get to use and we get to develop, 
And also, one of the, the, I've been in this business 35 years, my dad was in it, his dad was in it, we go back to the 30s, my daughter works in it today. Um, once people get inside, the other thing they know is they can make a difference. Um, it's highly competitive, it's highly focused on change, we're not stuck in the past, we're always trying to figure out how to do things better. And I do think that fits, as Jim said, today's generation, who really want to believe what they do today matters. And actually, when you look at those stats I just talked about, look at what this industry has done in this country in just the last eight years. That was men and women who came to work every day to make it different than it was the day before and actually did make it different. And that rate of change, I don't think is going to slow down. I, uh, you can read all the forecasts you want. Jim talked about it earlier. We're going to make these wells better and bigger than before. We're going to do it more efficiently. We're going to reduce the impact we have. We're going to do everything we can to be great neighbors while we're doing that stuff. But that is all people. That's all individuals who make that happen. That's great. But it, it is high tech. I mean, the yeah. thing that you talked about, and I, I think the big attraction to, to individuals coming out of college now is the recognition that it's high tech. I mean, I think of this industry similar to the medical field as two high tech industries. I mean, if you, you think about it, the medical field is using technology to see inside a body, watch fluid movements, check organs, that type of thing. We're using similar technology to see under the ground and check fluid movements and, you know, where things sit, things like that. So I, I think there is a growing recognition of the high technology impact of this industry. The other thing is the use of data. Now, we hear all the thing, big data, use of data. I mean, we've got a drilling data center in Houston where we can see all our onshore rigs, where there's Permian Basin, Eagleford, uh, up here in the DJ Basin on one wall in one conference room, and it's capturing and processing a terabyte of data per rig per day. And I don't even know what the hell that means, but it sounds like <laughs> a lot of data that these folks come out and, and they get excited about being able to use that type of thing. You go out to a rig nowadays and it looks like somebody's running a video game with all the controls and all the, the things that they can use to, as Jim said, remotely automate. Uh, same thing on completion units. So I, I think there's a growing understanding of that, but it's something we need to continue to highlight. Well, so, that, just I'm sorry, quick, Jim. quick add to that. I mean, you think about it today, um, and we've often said this, uh, it, it's rocket science. You can drill down two miles, go out two miles and hit a coffee can. Yeah. Think about that. It's, it's amazing technology, and, and, and that's what this panel is about. Just so, it, if you look at our advancements and how this industry has continued to get something out of nothing, it's been amazing, and it's been through technology. So I, again, I think it fits real well with today's generation. Yeah, that's great. I, we have a couple of great questions here. I don't know if we have if I can go over time a little bit, but one thing that tagged on a little bit to what you were saying, Dave. Somebody asked, "How close are we to measuring production continuously for each individual stage of a well?" And maybe Jim or Dave or Doug, any of you might want to talk about that. Yeah, I mean. I to a certain extent, we're doing it now. We've, we've got our operations center in Greeley that, uh, you know, from an automation standpoint, is measuring operations, production, ability to see where we need to send people to address an issue, ability to, and in many cases, even remotely shut things in and things. You know, what has been interesting in innovation and how it comes from everywhere, we had a scenario, and it ties a little bit to this, where we were trying to figure out how to keep people off tank batteries. You know, how to not go up strap tanks, open thief hatches, that type of thing. So we had some folks look at it from both from a safety standpoint and a reducing emissions standpoint and came up with a design where you could do all that without having to get up on a tank, just approach the tank, take a reading, set up automatic, and actually submitted that and got approved a new API standard for, for tank measuring type of thing. So it's, it's just another example how we continue to advance, move to more automation, move to more ability to see things in a new way, and actually not have to have people touch things. I mean, on that same question, if you go even more detailed, um, you know, we've now run fiber optics along the entire horizontal 
So Jim talked about as you treat the well, understanding how each perforation, each state, where, what's happening in each stage of that frac job. We've actually measured that in real time. Uh, then when we put the well on, we actually measure in real time the production along essentially every 12 to 15 feet of that well bore. Um, and this is space age stuff because just remember, this isn't like laying a fiber optic cable in a ditch outside your home. We're strapping it to a, a piece of pipe that's gonna go two miles down, two miles that way. It's hot. Um, it's got all sorts of you know, oil and gas and other uh, products to work with. W while we're stimulating that well, it's rocking and rolling and shaking and vibrating. And it's gotta survive all of that environment and then give us this data in real time. And you know, a few years ago, if someone had told you we were gonna go do that, they'd say, you're crazy, that'll never work. But it does, and, and it did because someone put these technologies together and said, how do we make them work in this application? Um, how far that'll go will actually probably be driven by how efficient we can be. Because what we know is it's now fairly cheap to get data. We drilled a well out in West Texas in 2014. We called it the Vox well. It's a, we think it's the most highly instrumented vertical well in the world. And then we drilled five horizontals by this well bore and measured in real time as we completed those wells and then produced them what was happening. And the amount of data we're getting off here is huge, but it's cheap now to get the data. And as Dave mentioned, the challenge now is how do you use all of that? How do you actually put it in a format where our engineers and geologists and other folks can actually figure out what, what it's telling them, what they would do next, how to do that. And that, so the, the big data in our business is happening, um, but a lot of it now is just driven by the fact that it's inexpensive to gather, and it's really inexpensive to get, to bring back to a central location and process where 10, 15, 20 years ago, the gathering was expensive, the, the measuring itself and then pulling it together was hard. Now the challenge is what do you do with all of it? How do you turn it into knowledge and decision making? Exactly. We need great, by the way, we need those great college students who really like to like, like software and figure out how to get a package to your front door. They need to help us figure out how to learn even more about well, the wells that we're drilling. Yeah. Maybe it's blockchain, but that's a whole other <laughs> panel I won't get into it today. We're kind of running out of time. But just if you could, one parting piece of advice. This is the 30th anniversary of Koga. Hmm. If you could think back to you as a 30-year-old in the industry, a long time. One piece of advice you might want to give yourself, and we'll just have you do that and then say thank you to our panel. Dave, do you want to start? Oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> now, I, I think it's recognizing that you, it's not just about understanding technology and implementing technology, it's about dealing with people. You know, put a priority on dealing with people, whether it's engaging with people in the company, whether it's engaging with people in the community, that creates that level of trust and understanding that's so important for our license to operate as a business. That's great. Yeah, I agree with that. I think when you look at technology today and you look at young people that are in the industry, we have some of the, the smartest out there. We recruit and we hire some of the smartest. But back to what Dave said, it's that those interpersonal skills and, and we have processes, we have tremendous tools, we have tremendous things that, that make us successful, but it's really individuals that make the difference. And those individuals that have those interpersonal skills to communicate, to understand, identify problems, and solve those problems, they're the ones that are gonna excel. And that's the piece that uh, I, I would advise a young person coming into our industry today those interpersonal skills and connectivity, as Dave said, with your coworkers, with your customers, and um, with your colleagues. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. But the other thing I'd tell them is, is just never quit learning and realize how many places you can learn. That intellectual curiosity is ultimately how we're solving all these problems and creating all this opportunity. And I can point to, members of our team who are 24 years old and are 67 years old. And those who are really making the most difference are those who just have this curiosity and never want to quit learning and figuring out what's the next problem to solve, where's the next place I can make a difference. And of course, you have to do that with others. Uh, this industry is a team sport. There is no doubt. Without guys like Jim, uh, and in fact, one of the coolest things we have, I got over 5,000 competitors, and we're better because of that. That's great. Well, if everybody in the audience could join me in thanking our panel today and
Really appreciate you being here. Yes, thank you, Lisa, thank you. Dave, and Doug, for a very enlightening discussion on game-changing technology. Up next, I uh, up next, we are so excited to have you joining us for the closing keynote session of the 2018 Energy Summit, which is focused on the 2018 election. Our moderate, I am honored to introduce our moderator, who is a remarkable leader and has provided a positive and proactive voice for our oil and gas community over and over and over again. So please help me welcome with a big round of applause for Dan Haley. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our final panel of the Energy Summit. Thank you to all of you who hung with us. I know these have been two uh, very packed days, but I appreciate all of you for being here and staying until the very end. As you have, uh, doing a little feedback, I'll stand back a little further from that mic. As you've no doubt noticed from some of the other panels we've had today, we have a big election coming up this fall, and there is a lot at stake for our industry, and frankly, our livelihoods are at stake. And we're gonna talk about that in this last panel. We have some uh, great guests lined up to talk to you about it. As I'm introducing them, I'm gonna ask everybody, if you could, to take out your cell phone and text WIN2018 to 77948. You will be connected to our COGA pledge and find a way to support our industry this fall. It's a great way to be engaged and to be informed. So if you could do that, text WIN2018.